My dear friends, several months ago, I had decided to wait until the end of Season 11 before I would render my judgment on it. Before I go all analytical, and I may decide not to, I want to say up front that I wasn't the biggest fan of the David Tennant years. I'm not going to say that those years weren't good or that Tennant wasn't a talented actor. It was more along the lines of the series stopped appealing to me. To be honest, I don't remember where. It seemed somewhere during or after the Tenet era that the sonic screwdriver was turned into a magic wand. But more to the point, Tenet's time on the TARDIS felt, to me, more like the role being turned into a comic book superhero. There was this air of inevitability that plagued the seventh Doctor, Sylvester McCoy, that the Doctor would always be successful and he was more of a superhuman, impervious to any mortal threat. He had no fear. But for Tenet, this was taken to extremes, marching up to gigantic alien monsters who had the power to wipe the Earth off the galactic map with the push of a button and whine and lecture them. Do you know who I am? That sort of thing. That, of course, was supposed to be enough to make any hardened space mass murderer wet his pants on the spot. And, of course, something touched upon with the Eighth Doctor, Paul McGann, the sort of kind of love interest was hinted at or suggested romantic or emotional attachments to Rose and Amy, which came later. I don't know. What do you think? Are we being prudish and old-fashioned or maybe consider romance in the TARDIS as a cheap plot trick? It's similar to the horrible deaths of companions that we would be seeing over the next years. I'm probably not alone in being a big fan of Christopher Eccleston's time on board. That was an amazing comeback for the series in 2005, with a nod to the Pertwee era by reintroducing the Nestines. What somehow rode in as baggage was the Third Doctor's being exiled to Earth, that sort of thing. Something like the 2005 series seemed to capture, and I wasn't too thrilled with that aspect of the first new series return. I just felt they spent too much time on the Doctor's favorite planet. Matt Smith got me interested in watching the series on a regular basis, like the same day it was being broadcast. And of course, I think most agree that Peter Capaldi was a massive and completely underused talent for the series. This is when, unfortunately, social justice and identity politics started working its way into the program. A little bit of man-hatred here, and a little bit of identity politics there, but it wasn't the basic premise of the show. Yes, yeah, some episodes were duds and some. His first few were pretty damn good. Then we got the sonic sunglasses and the electric guitar, and I was like, eh, no, just no. Let's talk about Capaldi's last appearance. And I touched on this in an earlier video, so I won't go over that ground too much here. But the apparent need to turn the first Doctor into some misogynist monster with Capaldi simpering around Bill made me cringe. But many of us believe that it set the stage for what was to be foisted upon us fans for season 11. I want to talk about a few disturbing trends in Doctor Who fandom. It seems there are people that are entrenched in intersectional third wave feminist ideology that they are unable to maturely handle honest criticism of the show. Well, first, since we're online, it's possible that some are not yet adults and therefore we shouldn't expect adult behavior from them. We don't know how old somebody is that we're communicating or reading their stuff online. But as for the over 18 or adult crowd, there is no excuse for the inability to parse someone else's criticisms. To be fair, there would be those who oppose the show merely because a woman is playing the lead role and for no other reason. What the regressive ideologues fail to comprehend is that for the entire lifetime of the series, there have been fans who did not like the latest incarnation going back to Patrick Troughton. We need to focus on this reality for a moment to get our heads around fans not accepting a new doctor and tuning out for whatever reasons they did so. We need to do this because for 55 years that role transition was always from a male to another male. It is notable that, and in this case it's more likely that it's the new woke fans that are making all the noise. Fans that may lack the ability to reflect on why others may oppose the new star of the show 
Jody Whitaker. I really haven't been exposed to much of the previously mentioned people who tuned out of the show only because a woman is in the lead. Really haven't seen that much online people talking like that. What I've seen on YouTube, Twitter, and in person, people disappointed with the show and have legitimate criticisms. Most of the time you will see those critiquing the series offering suggestions on how or what they would do to improve it. However, the members of the Church of Identity Politics do not allow heretical thinking. You are commanded to embrace Miss Whitaker and are harshly condemned if you don't. Banished from fan circles and told that you are not a real fan. Is that what being a fan is? Like a religion? Attached to some dogma of how you are supposed to behave as a fan? Sounds crazy, but this is what's happening. So, with that being said, I want to talk about the good, the bad, and the supremely ugly of Season 11 of Doctor Who. The good. Previous to Season 11, I really did get fed up with the Doctor saving the universe every week. It was getting kind of yawnland. Oh, he saved the universe again. Oh, how boring. Now, of course, he didn't save the Earth or the entire universe every week. But after the first new season, the show seemed to be wandering up the explosion, death to everything, and special effects pyramid to the point that the producers of the show had to sit back and ask, what are we going to do next week? We've saved the universe a few dozen times. We've either blown up the moon, sent the Earth to some other end of the galaxy, and returned it, had aliens smash into Big Ben, Daleks, and Cybermen taking over the Earth. We're sort of running out of ideas, like with the Christmas special. Yuck, yuck. The new season seemed to steer away from this, although you could say they saved the Earth in the final episode and the entire universe with the frog thing the week before. I think it was the week before. They did attempt to not rely on the traditional enemies, like the Daleks and Cybermen which I do applaud their efforts, although for as pointless as most of the stories and as bad as the writing has been for the 11th season, maybe they should have given us a wee bit of the oldies, not wee little monsters. At first, I was hoping there would be less sonic screwdriver magic wand use, and at first we didn't see much of this, but Whitaker spends half the show gawking at it with that stupid David Tennant face that actually worked for David Tennant. One thing my wife pointed out about the series, and I'll agree with her, is that it's supposed to be a sort of sci-fi fantasy escape. And I have to admit, with all its flaws, that it certainly scores well there. Another thing worth mentioning, the ensemble cast works fairly well. Possibly because of the obvious talent of Bradley Walsh. Even with factoring in the enormous drag caused by the weak acting of Jodie Whittaker and Mandip Gill. The bad. First off is the writing. It's not as much the bad writing as it was the lecturing to the fans about how terrible white men are. If you haven't already done so, please look up Bowles Trek's videos on this. He covers the subject so expertly. There is no doubt left over. The season opener is Sans Tardis. Whitaker wanders around imitating Tennant and Smith, making that face like a fish struggling to breathe. I've seen it referred to online as the diarrhea face. I can't say I was impressed by the tooth face or flying spaghetti monster, and the show was a bore. The show ends with the magic wand sonic screwdriver sending them into deep space without spacesuits. The Ghost Monument has the crew still without a TARDIS, but end up on a planet with some Death Race 2000 thing going on. They battle killer robots, yawn, and silly flying toilet paper monsters. More open mouth fish faces and well, blow me, the TARDIS is the Ghost Monument and the crew is saved. The third episode in the new season goes straight into social justice lecture mode. They take a brave and noble woman, Rosa Parks, whose courageous story has inspired a generation of people to fight for human rights and turned it into a white people bad, white people racist story. Some mysterious racist from the future, for some reason, has decided to go back in time and change history, so Rosa doesn't get to do her thing. With all his Artron energy and fancy high-tech futurist gadgets, he somehow didn't take into account the old neural restrictor thing, which means he can't actually harm anyone, which effectively makes him useless. Throughout the history of the show, the Doctor has struggled with non-interference wherever he went, and even being punished 
at the end of the Troutmuir in the war games for his constant meddling. John Pertwee ended up being stranded on Earth for his efforts. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out why they decided to create a story where they were trying to keep history the same. I do know that there are altruistic motives behind this, in the story that is, but I do believe that this was virtue signaling via the BBC, seeing where they have been heading these days. If anyone watching has ever lived in or visited places where there is open, hostile racism or have been the recipient of its ugliness, it's not a pretty sight, to say the least. It's understandable that Chibnall and Whitaker are fine with shoving our faces in hatred towards white men. Here is a quote from an interview Whitaker did for Vulture that tells us what we need to know. She says, Exactly. What Chris wanted to do, particularly in the cast and in the story, is reflect the world we live in today. Very often, we're only seeing stories being told through the white male gaze. The white male gaze? Really, Jody? Perhaps this has something to do with the toxic white masculinity of the previous doctors, you think? Arachnids in the UK was probably the most awesomely stupid episode of the season. There was this horrible Donald Trump type of person who wasn't Donald Trump and apparently despised Donald Trump, and why not? Doesn't everybody hate the orange man? This was a low point in the season that is already scraping the bottom. Scary spiders everywhere. What do we do? Just wait for them to die. Okay. The Tsaranga Conundrum is another episode written by showrunner Chris Chibnall. Shows his lack of ability to write an interesting story. So there's this extraordinarily stupid little space monster that eats everything but people and conveniently only eats things that make the story just suspenseful enough without ending it in two minutes because it eats through the hull and everyone is sucked out into space. Jody Whitaker runs through the ship like a chicken with its head cut off while, and get this, a man is pregnant and giving birth to a baby. Yes, they have done it. Trans activism now has a place in Doctor Who. A few seasons ago, they changed the gender of the master, then that other Time Lord, so it's, and I quote, now in the canon. But guess what? Men getting pregnant is now in the canon. We can now start using terms like birthing people and lactators and menstruators. The show has hit peak trans. Demons of the Punjab, with all its flaws, and I'll get into that, is actually the one I enjoyed watching the most. Set in India or Pakistan or both during the partition, we see at a personal family level how that division of the subcontinent was so devastating. What bothered me is that the TARDIS team decide to go back in time for frivolous reasons. Yasmin is curious about a watch from her grandmom or aunt or someone. So Chibnall is using the time machine as a temporal traveling vacation service. Forget that the Indian partition was too complex and catastrophic an event to have justice done to it in a short popular television show. One thing I thought was weak in this episode was that the evil alien killers were just poor misunderstood galactic philanthropists. A plot twist I did not see coming. Kerblam! I thought this was just plain infantile. Some sinister being or person is plotting to kill everyone using the future version of Amazon.com, but in this case it's not a case of production machination gone wild but a sinister white man. Chibnall's go-to character for evil. Ironically, the evil automated production system isn't the killer. It's actually trying to save people. Since it's the evil white man, oh, let's move on. The Witchfinders sunk us deeply in virtue signaling, yes. Yes, we know several hundred years ago, the patriarchy did indeed run the world. Men were in positions of power and women seldom so. We already know this. So why is it shoved in our faces at every opportunity? Was King James gay? Who cares? But I'm sure all the woke fans were giggling with delight. Back in the early 1960s, Doctor Who commenced as an educational television program that focused on history, with a bit of science fiction thrown in for fun. The producers of the show quickly learned that episodes with historical themes weren't very popular and were pretty much nixed within a few years. Chibnall thinks that children need to be re-educated, I guess. But not on quality historical content, but with intersectional feminist ideology. It takes you away is the Doctor Who version of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 
More like the frog, the troll, and the Nordic mirror. Or was it? This actually could have been a pretty decent episode had they not polluted it with white male guilt for the father leaving his blind daughter behind and the most horribly awful ending where the doctor convinces a frog who represents some alternate universe a frog. Anyway, the doctor talks the frog into thinking they are friends so don't destroy our universe. Oh, and by the way, since we're all buddy-buddy now and feeling the warm vibes, could you just go away and help your new friend out? That was on the same level of unimaginative and terrible ending that the spider episode had and is in the same league as and then i woke up the series finale was probably the most watchable out of the 10 for me the battle of ran score of Kalos, chipnell said that he wasn't going to be using any of the old enemies or monsters in the new series so i suppose by bringing back tim shaw from the first episode, good old Timmy may be the start of the new stable of scary monsters for the series. I wonder, but once again the Doctor had to save the planet Earth. I guess some things never change. Hey old Chib, what we gonna do for a season finale? Don't know mate, how about they save the Earth again? What you think? So we're told that the Christmas special is cancelled for this year. Because they ran out of ideas. They ran out of ideas, all right, and it was before writing this season. We're going to get a New Year's Day special instead. I guess that won't offend the multicultural woke fans. There are also rumors that Chibnall and Whitaker may be leaving the show after the next season, which is rumored to be shorter than even this one and possibly split into 2019 and 2020. I am not like some critics of season 11 who want the series canceled. I think they can salvage it and possibly put it on course to become a show that takes itself less seriously. Like others have mentioned, do I think Chibnall and team will double down on identity politics and PC culture for the future? I do think they will. For Doctor Who fans, the older, dedicated fans, past was glorious. The present is meh, and the future looks bleak. This is how the series hit me at a gut level. It seemed to me to be catering to a very young crowd, and or one that is very easily entertained. As others have remarked on their reaction to the season as a whole, I did see the social justice aspect, not as something tossed in here and there as with the last few seasons, but as being at the core of the program. We as fans, whether it be longtime ones or newer ones, just want to be entertained. As I said in the video I created as an initial reaction to the choice of a woman playing the lead role, it matters little to me who plays the doctor as long as they can handle the responsibility of the honor of playing that character. I think Whitaker falls short. She seems clueless and not in control. I know that Peter Davison was dogged by the stigma of being a feckless, useless doctor. He did eventually rise to the occasion and filled the doctor's boots quite well. Will I give Jodie Whitaker a chance? I already have by watching the entire series as aired always within a few hours of its initial broadcast on the BBC. I can't say that I think it's the worst or truly terrible, but it isn't very good. With all the modern camera work and a bigger budget than the original series ever dreamed of, I find it lackluster. Not in appearance, there it's bright and shiny, but dull in the imagination category. Please comment below where you agree or disagree. Remember, arguing and calling people names is not conducive to an intelligent discussion. Please do check out what I referred to as my crappy animation parodies of the series, Doctor Who Social Justice Warrior. Links below in the description. Thanks again for watching this channel. Please help out and subscribe and hit the like button. If you want notifications on new content, don't forget to click the bell. Goodbye. Goodbye.